Feminist Network. My name is Sophie Watson and I'm the co-president of the network. My co-president and fellow organiser Phoebe Fuller is also here with us, as is Imogen Galilee, um, who founded the network back in 2018. Are you there, Phoebe, Imogen? Hello. Hi. Great, okay. Um, they're gonna both be helping me moderate tonight and you'll hear much more from them in later events um, um, as we go through the next six weeks. We also have the wonderful Mary from Object who's giving up her Tuesday evenings for the next six weeks in order to help us out. Um, she'll be moderating and also um, handling any technical issues that come up. So if you notice any problems um, with that side of things, please do say in the chat or flag it up to us somehow and Mary will be swooping in to fix it. Um, today, we're really, really excited to have Julie Bindle, um, journalist, feminist, public thinker, here to kick the lecture series off. She really needs very little introduction, um, but she owes her invitation to speak tonight, not only to her decades of campaigning on behalf of women, but to Manchester University's Student Union, who um, deplatformed her back in 2015, to prevent her giving a talk called, I think, from, from Liberation to Censorship, Does Modern Feminism Have a Problem with Free Speech? So I'll just leave that there um, and you can draw what conclusions you will. The plan tonight is for Julie to speak for about 25 minutes, half an hour, and then we'll devote the rest of our time together to trying to get your questions for her answered and have a bit of a conversation. We'd like to ask, we'd like it if you'd ask those using the Q&A function for those of us who are with us on Zoom. Um, that's separate from the chat function, just as a note for fellow technophobes. Um, and we'd love to see you interacting and discussing things among yourselves in the chat. But if you just ask your questions specifically for Julie in the Q&A, that makes it a lot simpler for me when it comes to reading them out. And hopefully I won't miss any that way. Um, okay, those of you joining us from YouTube, please do just put questions in the comments as usual. Um, Phoebe, Imogen and myself will, will all be keeping an eye on them and, and hopefully we'll pick up on them and be able to get all of your questions answered tonight too, but we'll see how we go with time. Um, we are expecting some attempts to disrupt and derail the event, which is why everyone's gonna be on mute. Um, I know that an event which is at least partially underpinned by free speech um, with everyone on mute is a bit of a, an oxymoron. We do appreciate the irony, but all of our speakers have been deplatformed at least once now. So our priority really has to be the kind of the smooth running of this event tonight. Um, please do exercise your right to speech in the chat. Um, feel free to disagree with everything anyone says. Feel free to uh, ask challenging questions. I hope that you will, but please do so relatively politely. Um, Mary is going to be standing by to Jackie Weaver, anyone who doesn't quite get the message or who isn't kind of entering into the spirit of the event. So we'll see how we go. Um, it's almost time to hand over to Julie. There are just a couple of things I need to add and I will try to keep it short. Um, Phoebe and I, and all of us, we just, we want to thank the rest of the network for all the work that they've put into this and all the support that they've given us over the last few months. Um, this has been a long time in the works, um, especially Eve who organized all the gorgeous promotional materials and posters and things that you will have seen on Facebook and Twitter. So thank you, Eve, and thank you, everyone. We also have to thank everyone else at Object, as well as Mary, for lending us this seminar, um, or lending us the seminar, the seminar platform, because it saved us an awful lot of time and money, and we just, we really appreciate it. Um, I think lastly, I just have to thank you, our audience, for being here. I know it's been, um, it's been a really horrible week, and everyone's feeling a bit raw. So thank you for coming along and engaging with us anyway. And this is the first event of its kind, as far as we can tell. Um, so, but we really do hope that it won't be the last. And if we can help anyone else set up a kind of a replatforming event, um, we'll offer whatever support and advice we can. So do just get in touch. I think that anyone involved in feminism at all over the last few years will know that the free speech of women is under threat. Um, Women have lost their jobs, they've lost contracts, they've been assaulted, they've received rape and death threats. Every effort is being made to frighten us into silence and compliance. And when that doesn't work, they try to take away the spaces we have um, in order to speak. But there's actually a quote that my co-president is really fond of, um, a quote that's from the correspondence of a suffragette called Millicent Fawcett, who, um, 
who actually helped establish my own college, Newnham, which is where I'm speaking to you from now. It goes, courage calls to courage everywhere and its voice cannot be denied. That's why you're all here tonight. And that's the reasoning behind this lecture series in a nutshell. Our opponents can smear us and take opportunities for us to speak away. But as long as there are people with enough courage to seek out ideas that are different, that they may, they may not always agree with, um, we'll always find ways to listen to each other and to be heard. So thank you again, everyone, um, for having that courage. And without further ado, here's Julie Bindle to talk about faux feminism, how feminism for men took over the academy. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate all of you feminists, all of the organizers and younger feminists who resist this bullshit and who dare to do what you're doing. You're doing it for all of the women that can't do it. And we owe you a big, a big thanks, big gratitude. And I suppose the most important thing I can say this evening is I'm not Julie Birchill. Anyone who's come along to see Julie Birchill, um, you may as well leave now, unless you want to have some feminism in which of course, please stay. Um, and what I'm going to talk about tonight is the way that what passes for feminism has become a dominant narrative in middle-class settings, because you will know this, many of you will know this, the nonsense that I'm going to talk about that masquerades as feminism, as progressiveness, doesn't cut much sway amongst working class communities and other communities that are struggling with material reality. Funny that, isn't it? So it's very, very much a kind of red brick university phenomena and it's driven by some academics that should really feel very deeply ashamed of themselves, but I doubt if they ever will. And so we're growing a whole new generation of feminists that hopefully um, will invade not just the academy, but all areas of life that's become dominated by this ideology. <clears throat> and I think to start, it's important for me to define what feminism is for me. Now, already I can hear, yes, but your feminism might not be my feminism. There are as many feminisms as there are feminists, etc. That's wrong, actually. Um, there, there are many ways to be a feminist, and most of them are wrong. Um, the only way to be a feminist is to send to women and girls in a liberation struggle to counter patriarchy, male supremacy, whatever you want to call it. So it's not that we set rules and regulations uh, and a membership card to become a feminist. You can call yourself whatever you want. But like every other political movement, social justice movement, we have a right to define what we are and why we are fighting what we are fighting. The disability rights movement, the anti-racist movement, the labor movement, the working class movement, the workers movement, all of those movements have an absolute right to define their own movement. And if somebody comes along to the workers or labor movement and tries to sell them uber capitalism, they'll be shown the door. So feminism is a quest for all women to be liberated from male supremacy. And it's also an acknowledgement that women are a sex class oppressed by men as a sex class and not as individuals. So we resist and reject the domination, subordination dynamic that inevitably emerges from the sex hierarchy. And that feeds in to rejecting femininity and the whole pink brain, blue brain nonsense. There's nothing natural or inevitable about our oppression as women or men's power over us. And therefore, feminism is a utopian movement which imagines a world in which patriarchy is over turned and women are not oppressed. To this end, feminism supports and promotes women only spaces, activism and consciousness raising as methods to achieve the goal of women's liberation. And I think that's important to say that we have heard a lot because of the threat to women only services for women who've been raped and otherwise abused by men, that we miss a really important piece, which is our right to our own space as women, to talk, to not be around men. We don't need to justify it and we don't need to be raped to deserve that space. It's what we fought for. And it's what the so-called second wave of feminism, let's just call it the women's liberation movement instead of all this waves nonsense. It's what feminism is built upon. 
the testimonies of women that recognize that they are not the only ones and that their abusers are not the only ones and that this is something to do with being a sex class. So to that end, we recognize that gender is distinct from sex. Gender is a social construct designed to impose rules of behavior on women, not roles, rules, also known as sex stereotypes. We prioritize exposing and ending male violence towards women and girls. And we also acknowledge that male violence is central to the way control women. And this includes all sexual exploitation. It doesn't matter that cash is changing hands. It's all the same shit. Now, clearly, feminism is a movement for all women. We have to recognize that all women are oppressed. If we're a sex class, then that goes without saying. But we also recognize that the oppression of women under patriarchy takes many different forms. None of us individually has experience of all the various forms of oppression endured by all women in every context. But collectively, we do recognize women's oppression as women. And only as a collective movement can we resist and overcome male violence and abuse. Now, it's not an individual viewpoint. We can't pick and choose who we like and decide that we'll fight for their rights, for their liberation, and not for the liberation of others. And fighting for women's rights is not the same as fighting for women's liberation. We need to progress radically in the direction of liberation. We don't just want the right that somebody else gives us. We have to liberate ourselves from our oppression. And over the decades, four decades, I've witnessed attempts to undermine, dilute and discredit the definition by men and by women. And this is why I'm saying that we don't just have a right to define feminism. We have a duty. We have an imperative to do so. And we have to stick to that right to do so. Now, the attempts to discredit and redefine feminism has always been motivated by the desire to prop up the status quo, not rock the boat, keep men happy and keep women in their place. And as I'll go on to say, in the 1970s, when open, raw, old fashioned sexism was rife and barely challenged, that is not that much different than what we're looking at now, but it just has a different face. I'm sure that many of us are sick of the differences between women being rammed down our throats. And I know many black women, uh, many uh, women who don't have the same experience as for example, a Cambridge University student are also sick of these differences being rammed down our throats. What we're being told is that we cannot have solidarity between women. It is in fact a ploy to fracture any solidarity and any sense of sisterhood that means that we will be a movement which looks at men collectively. Misogyny in the form of male violence and the threat of male violence affects us all. And this is the only thing that unites women on the planet, but it's a huge thing. It is major. Now, gender and the rewriting of gender and its meaning is really important to feminist backlash has taken hold because feminists actually employed the term gender as a theoretical tool to describe the social construction of femininity and masculinity. In other words, it was used to educate us about how these sex stereotypes were so imposed upon us, so fixed, so difficult of. But we're now being told to forfeit that term and to concede that it means the opposite, a biological phenomenon which determines our assumed identity. We're told that anyone that challenges this new orthodoxy is of course a turf and a fascist. We're told we're on the wrong side of history, that the rights of trans women trump all other rights, and we should be silent as our rights are eroded. So the enemies of feminism have changed their tactics over time, and feminists have had to remain vigilant and become ever more inventive and resourceful to combat new obstacles. But as I say, same old, same old. Feminism is simply the old enemy in a new guise, and sometimes new enemies enter the battleground. And that's what's been going on this last couple of decades. And 
And bearing in mind that the women's liberation movement emerged from the political left, it's shocking, and, and which is where it should remain. And I'm very adamant about that. It has no place on the right. It has no place for single issue forging alliances with the right. But if you look at the history of male left sexism, there are countless examples in the UK and the US of women's resistance to that. So at a leftist demonstration, for example, in Washington, 1969, which coincided with President Nixon's swearing in ceremony, feminists demanded that they be given a voice to protest the sexism within the leftist movement. When the women began to address the crowd, all hell broke loose from the men who shouted, laughed, heckled and booed. One bellowed, take her off the stage and fuck her. Another yelled, fuck her down a dark alley. And the organisers, all men, just led the women off the stage. And I would argue that what we're seeing now is exactly that. Exactly that. The hostility and bullying that I faced as a young feminist came from deeply sexist men, unreconstructed sexists women who found feminism threatening and the far right, it was easy to spot your enemy. But the hostility and bullying that younger feminists have to deal with now comes primarily from the so-called progressives of their generation. And I have interviewed countless women between the ages of 18 and 30 for my forthcoming book. I really wanted to hear the voices of young women from a, a range of class social uh, backgrounds. And, and I'm, I, I want to, this book is for, for those women, because what I can see now is the double bind that younger feminists are in, where they are getting horrendous hostility and even threats of violence and violence from their, their own so-called progressive male allies. So they will tell women, and this is a big university thing, they'll tell women um, how you should see prostitution or sex work, as they call it. Pornography, if you don't like pornography, you don't like sex. And of course, transgender ideology, extreme transgender ideology, which has been presented as the feminist position. And some of these men are heads of feminist societies or head of the LGBTQQI2 Spirit Plus Society. And they're wondering, how can this be feminism? They've seen how porn is used as a form of sexual harassment and abuse. They've seen how pornography is used to justify or even assist sexual assault. These women want to be liberated from a culture of misogyny and believe feminism would help them achieve this and this is what they get. And many young feminists now are going back to key feminist texts from an earlier era from the 1960s, 70s onwards, to find that clarity of analysis and to inform their current politics. And many of the young women I've spoken to have found texts like Kate Millett, um, Audre Lorde, Andrea Dworkin from the 70s and 80s and just been blown away by the relevance it has to their lives. A number of young women are reverting to methods of campaigning pioneered by first and second wave feminists, recognising the need to engage with real women and with each other, to be physically present, clearly it's a problem at the moment, but to become more vocal campaigning outside of online forums, many of which have become toxic spaces, to be seen and to see each other. And alongside this, we have a growing global movement of sex trade survivors and their allies, and they're refusing to accept the sex work narrative promoted by academics and others that peddle the lie that sex work is labour or even that it's empowering. The word empowering is interesting, isn't it? Because it's only those without the power that it's ascribed to. Have a think about the last time you saw a rich white man talking about empowerment, his own empowerment. Never. So we have hashtag feminism and we have the, the he for she initiatives from Emma Watson, which is obviously, you know, like more like she for he for he or he for he. Um, made a big noise in the media, lots of men cheer, cheering along, but achieved absolutely nothing concrete for women's liberation. And thankfully, we still have active materialist feminism, which fights for the liberation of women who've experienced male violence and who've been ill-treated by the state. So feminism is for all women, despite the attempts to divide us. 
But even a woman who has no experience of violence from her immediate partner, for example, or within her workplace, she's controlled or her life is curtailed by the fear of male violence from other men. And she often is told she needs to rely on the protection of men. And sometimes she does. And I think this explains anti-feminist women, the women that really hate feminism, because it's difficult, it's challenging. And that is why feminists talk about compulsory heterosexuality, not just as women being coerced into sexual relationships with men, such as forced marriage or punishment rape, but it's about the mechanisms by which women themselves come to desire those relationships in order to be valued by men, deemed attractive by men, protected by men, and ultimately accepted by other women in society. But feminism is flourishing, but so is the backlash to it. And this always happens, of course, it's a measure of our success. But whether or not you're a feminist, it's essential to understand that the misogyny so prevalent across the globe affects all women, whoever and wherever you are. Men have always told women to chill out about issues such as pornography and sexual violence. But what's new and particularly shocking is that now many women who label themselves feminist are saying the same thing. Under this rebranded feminism, it's acceptable, if not obligatory for young progressive men to refer to older feminists as Nazis and fascists, even though the women they're insulting are the ones who spent their whole lives fighting to end male violence and support women. There's a big thing about many young anti-feminist, faux feminists not knowing their history, not understanding that their rights were not handed to them on a plate by, by um, it, just because it happened organically. It, it, it's ridiculous. We're told we're irrelevant, we're cancelled, and the opposite of what passes as feminist in today's world. And a dialogue about what feminism means has always been part of the women's movement, with a number of misleading and inaccurate definitions creeping into popular use. As I said before, it's more vital than ever that we define feminism as a political movement to change the distribution of power. If we don't have that definition, we don't have the basis for our campaigning and demands. And the reason why I keep coming back to this is because we are under such pressure to open feminism up to mean everything and therefore nothing. And it is the most co-opted political definition on the planet. If feminism is how any individual defines it, then we have already lost the battle. Just imagine socialists saying socialism is whatever anyone who opposes capitalism feels like identifying as socialism. Hello, Owen Jones. Maybe someone needs to tell him that. So young women in universities and other settings are being silenced and bullied into accepting a form of feminism that benefits men and that's harmful to women. Of the many women under the age of 30 I interviewed, every single one had a similar story of being told that they are racist, transphobic, bigoted, anti-sex, whorephobic, biphobic, homophobic, for simply stating the basics of feminism. These basics include the fact that women have the right to organise autonomously, that prostitution is dangerous and it's about the male sex right, not about empowerment of women, and that gender is a harmful social construction that promotes sex stereotypes and maintains women's subordination to men. And when feminists have never denied the biological differences between women and men, but have always resisted these differences being used as a reason to abuse and demean us. The political consequences for women in losing our single sex spaces are severe and recognizing biological sex as distinct from gender identity is important, if not crucial, when we look at crime statistics, especially sex crime. In 2019, freedom of information requests uncovered the fact that in more than 10 police forces across the UK, if a man is arrested for or convicted of rape, the official record will state the gender they choose to identify themselves as before putting male or female, regardless of whether or not that person has intact male genitalia. Imagine having to refer to your rapist as she in a police interview or in court. And I see the extreme transgender ideology and the men that spout about it from the rooftops as being part of the men's rights movement. But it's not the men's rights movement that the liberals used to say 
was abhorrent, that the liberals used to say, oh, that's awful. The ones that dressed in superhero outfits and jumped off the tops of high buildings, if only, paraded themselves on the tops of high buildings, um, talking about how they couldn't get access to their children and talking about how women were the perpetrators of domestic abuse, not men. No, 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 these are the Owen Joneses. These are the ones dressed up as progressives. And really, you know, these, these men, they want to call us cunts. They, they hate us. They hate feminism. They hate women pointing the finger at men, at violent men, at entitled privileged men. So instead, they take the opportunity to use it, the trans rights ideology. It's perfect for them because they can say that we are the oppressors. And they've gained traction because the liberals are on their side, not ours. Or they're too scared to speak out in uh, in our uh, defence, although increasingly because of more feminists like the organisers of this event, they are speaking out. So the misogynist men of old, you know, used to denounce feminism as anti-men, say we hate men, say that we're all ugly lesbians. Um, but they're wolves in sheep's clothing, because just think about what they're saying about us now. They're saying that, that lesbians should, em should embrace the penis um, and we're transphobic if we don't. Of course, they're saying that we hate men. They're saying that our transphobia, as they put it, is just anti-male rhetoric. So it's just the same old bullshit. And these men's form organisations with a remit to support male violence of female violence often. It's just classic gaslighting. So what do we do? Well, we are doing it. We are resisting. We are fighting back against this. But it's shocking to see how our progress has really been halted and rolled back to a degree because the Liberals have gone onto the wrong side and because the good people that really should be speaking out have decided to be cowards and not speak up for those that can't. In February 2005, two months before she died, I spoke to Andrea Dworkin and I asked her just in conversation how she coped with hearing endless stories about the abuse and degradation of women. She told me, if I give up now, younger generations of women will be told that porn is good for them and they will believe it. And now look. So things move on. Feminist strategies change. We learn more from each other through the generations. I learn so much from younger feminists. But there are some things that will always be the case. Men will tell us that what is bad for us is good for us. That what we're saying, no, I don't want that, we really do want. And this is what's happening now. And we need to listen to those women that have been saying it about male violence forever. So the resurgence of feminist activism, in particular in relation to campaigns against male violence, is in response to the unbridled misogyny on both the left and the right. And cancel culture, obviously, which prompted this series, is aimed at us disobedient bitches daring to challenge the faux feminism promoted by male and female anti-feminists more often than not in universities. So our work is far from done. While sites like Pornhub promote rape as entertainment and lesbians are told to suck my dick for refusing to capitulate to bullies. So in short, woman hating has been dressed up as progressive politics. And you can see this very clearly with the libertarian all sex is good sex movement, which has been around forever. By which I mean that we are anti-sex prudes and moralists if we so much as question some of the sexual practices that are now passing as liberating and pleasurable for women. So the latest addition to the LGBTQQI2 Spirit Plus is K for kink. And much of what is called kink is really bondage, discipline, sadomasochism, BDSM, with the majority of heterosexual men who practice BDSM taking on the role of the sadist. Straightforward, same old. And strangulation is extremely popular among male BDSMers. 
And in a recent animation style safety guide aimed at young women involved in BDSM, when I say involved, I mean coerced, the strangler was advised to watch the face of the woman he's strangling in case it goes a puce colour and to make sure that any bloodshot marks in the eyes are given time to heal before resuming the choking. Of course, if a person wishes to seek sexual pleasure from being throttled, who am I to interfere, goes the good liberal response. And of course, the oft repeated uh, and cliched mantra, what happens between consenting adults in the bedroom? But they really need to kind of learn a lesson about what consent is or isn't before lecturing young women. So Cosmopolitan, a magazine aimed at young women, I think between the ages of 25 and 40, had its 2021 guide to anal sex for beginning. You need a lot of lube, they said in the strap line and rushed to reassure its readers that yes, there is a safe way to have a cannibalism fetish. I kid you not, a cannibalism fetish. And this was a response to some bell end who had been exposed as wanting to bite chunks off women and drink their blood during sex. And those who object to feminists spoiling their fun by talking about male harassment and verbal abuse because they're like it, um, a given a real kind of, um, I think, a big showing in the media because it's perfect for the misogynistic media outlets such as Vice. So Paris Lee is a trans woman who identifies as a feminist, is a regular writer for Vice. And she wrote about a holiday in Ibiza and said um, that she was catcalled, sexually objectified and treated like a piece of men by um, a piece of meat by men the entire week. And it was absolutely awesome. Lee was writing in opposition to an article by Laura Bates, the founder of the Everyday Sexism Project, on the prevalence of street harassment and the feminist campaign to eradicate it. According to Lee's, the feminist objection to men harassing women in public is part of a culture, I quote, that infantilizes women and teaches them to be constantly afraid. Uh, turning their analysis to class, Lee then suggests that a certain kind of middle class woman is particularly offended by catcalls. I quote, there is a sense of being sullied if an uncouth or lower class kind of man, a white van man, for example, heckles. So these middle class women, Lee's continues, apparently believe that all men are rapists in waiting and that all victim women are victims in waiting. For Lee's, the working class builder is the victim of classist bigotry from women. So constantly we're being told that we are abusing and depressing men in whatever form. Lee's isn't the only one that talks about middle class women complaining about these men, as though, of course, middle and upper class men never harass women. They really should go down to one of the bars on any night of the week in the city and perhaps they'll learn a lesson. <coughs> so. We've talked about women only space and how it's not just about refuges and rape crisis centre. It has to be that we have the right to not be around men. We have the right to not be in sexual relationships with men. We have the right to say that this is something that we very freely and happily choose rather than that we're born with some rogue gene, which means we can't help ourselves but be lesbians. The whole born this way narrative about lesbianism is so gay male. It is so conservative, regressive and essentialist. And it takes every single bit of pride out of women saying, we have the right to an autonomous sexuality, whether it's celibacy, heterosexuality, or being a lesbian. And of course I would recommend um, lesbianism naturally. So I'm going to um, end soon because I really want a conversation with you and I just want to say in terms of how we move forward and how we tackle this, the more of us that can speak out, the more of us that are able to, and I'm aware that many women can't, that are able to safely speak out and challenge this bullshit and ask other feminists, perhaps older feminists, maybe feminists that have been around for longer, maybe feminists that have less to lose, maybe feminists that actually can afford to do this, to ask for our support, because we will stand in front of young women that can't say this stuff, but want to and need to, and we will take a bullet. So, 
Ending patriarchy is unlikely to happen in our lifetime. However, we need to have a utopian vision. We absolutely have to, because every other social justice movement does. When we talk about combating animal abuse, we imagine a world where animals aren't tortured. We imagine a world without child abuse. We can imagine a world without poverty and we have to imagine a world without racism. So why is it that for feminists, we're constantly told that we can't see that world, that that world isn't available for us to experience in our imaginations? Because otherwise, why would we be fighting for this world? Why would we be, we be working I think that what we have to do is to rather than see us escaping from male abuse, from male oppression, we have to see ourselves as ending it and stopping it and being liberated from it. And that's why a vision of women's land, as nice as I'm sure it sounds, although it wouldn't be for me, yes, it's it's a nice idea that we don't have to put up with these bell ends, but this isn't going, this is no substitute for material change. It holds little or no appeal for those of us that wish to face the music rather than hide away. But remember, we are a movement. We are a global movement. And there are those of us that can take the flack in order for you to stand up and be counted. And we will do that. Without a utopian goal, political activity can only be strategic. And there are hundreds of feminist campaigns I've been involved in or supported where we knew we were never going to win. For example, I would truly love a curfew on men, a state imposed curfew on men. Let's just try it just for a week or two. Well, that's not going to happen. But let's achieve the goals that we know are achievable. And we can end prostitution and pornography. We can end male violence. There's nothing natural or innate about this. But there is something in young women that is building like a fire in the belly. And we have to imagine a world that we've not yet lived in, because if we don't plan for new possibilities, then how will we ever get there? So most women, we know this, most women dare not admit the extent to which our lives are controlled and influenced by the fear and reality of male violence. For heterosexual women or women with sons looking across the breakfast table at those men and wondering about them or knowing about them is horrific. It's unsettling, but this is the world we live in and it's up to us to fight for a different world. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Julie. Um, I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of all of my fellow panellists um, when I say that that's exactly what I needed to hear this week, aside from anything else, um, this decade really, but there you go. Um, so I'll, I'll launch straight into the questions. We've had some fantastic questions um, and they can sort of be grouped into a few different groups almost. Um, ones that are looking at the relationship between feminism and, and being an active feminist and, and then your other kind of political allegiances, ones that are more practical about the future of feminism and how to do it on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think before we go into that, um, maybe it's worth clearing up um, a question that's about a specific experience you had at Edinburgh University um, a couple of years ago. I'll read out the whole question just so that anyone who missed that whole thing somehow um, has the context, but here we go. Um, in June 2019, after you'd given a talk on women's rights at Edim uh, Edinburgh University, you were attacked by a trans-identifying man as you left the building. Screaming abuse, he swung a punch at you, but luckily a group of security guards managed to pull him away. Your attacker was boasting about it on social media afterwards, though claiming not to have tried to hit you. As there were witnesses to the assault and his identity is known, did the police take any action against him or did they let this pass without any penalty? And um, that one's from Janet. Thank you for that question. And I'm delighted to be able to clear this up because this man was in fact charged and was convicted and given a community safety order. Um, so he was required to do, I don't know, some elderly people's gardens or pay a fine. I didn't ask what what the penalty was, but certainly um, he didn't go to court because I decided that it wouldn't be appropriate to send somebody um, who possibly needs some intervention um, other than other than um, 
the long arm of the law. But it was a really nasty attack. It did take several security men to pull him off. He was definitely going to punch my face. And from the way he was swinging his arms very hard. And there was some national and a lot of national and international media coverage about it. Um, not only from the so-called LGBTQQI media that decided that I was lying, but also um, an awful headline in the Guardian newspaper, a newspaper that I've written for since the 90s, which was pretty much something like, I mean, the report wasn't bad, but it was something like, because she's a transphobic bigot, she got attacked. Um, and the headline was immediately changed when the editor came in after following several Report. So, yeah, he was he was, in fact, um, convicted of that crime. And um, it's quite extraordinary that I had to ask one of the reporters that got the details of the conclusion of that case from um, the Edinburgh police in order to be able to prove that this did happen and that I wasn't lying or making it up. So there were two narratives. One was that I completely lied about it just because I'm a transgender bigot. And the second is that uh, I asked for it. It did happen, but I asked for it. Yeah, they're both, um, they're both, I think, pretty typical narratives when it comes to media coverage of this stuff. And to me, it's reminiscent of um, The Sun running a headline about, um, or running a piece written by um, JK Rowling's abusive ex-husband um, with kind of no, feminist commentary or just decent human being commentary whatsoever. Um, so I think it's interesting to see The Guardian being grouped in or grouping themselves in with that kind of that kind of reporting. But there you go. Um, we've got another we've got another question that's just come in that maybe I'll, I'll just ask before kind of going into the more ones. Um, this is someone who would like to know your reaction. Um, to the University of Leicester producing a student sex worker kit um, and about how you feel it will affect the lives of female students on campus, as well as the ideology that led to the university deciding this was appropriate. Um, shame on them um, and shame on all of those pro sex work academics that sit in their ivory towers that seem to think that being prostituted is great fun and completely harmless, but who would never have to do it themselves. And I recall doing a debate with the English collective of prostitutes who are not in a collective and they've never been in prostitution, um, where they were putting forward this nonsense. And of course the, the academic research, which is a scandal, um, backs this up, backs this ideology up. And of course it leaves particular class of women in the gutter, whether they're native uh, Canadian women, working class black women, they, they just say, well, there's some women that just, this is all there is for them. So it's a disgrace. Um, and I was at this university debate, should sex work be decriminalized, the usual. And what they mean is decriminalize the entire uh, uh, trades. They mean the pimps, they mean the punters, they mean the traffickers, they mean the whole lot of brothel owners. And I was with a sex trade survivor called Sabrina Valis, who um, was prostituted under legal regimes in Australia and New Zealand, as well as illegal regimes. So she knows the score. She knows that decriminalization doesn't ever help the women. It just, it just helps the pimps. Um, and just to clarify, we should decriminalize any person selling sex, um, but no other uh, player in the sex trade. So this student, typical male, white, overly privileged, posh boy, said to Sabrina when she'd given her talk, her side of the debate, well, I did a shift over the summer holidays in McDonald's. It was awful. The manager was horrible to me, shouted at me. I had to work two hours overtime without being paid. And I got splashed with hot fat at the end of my shift. And Sabrina said to him, right, yeah, that's not a very nice job. What would you rather do, McDonald's or bend over that table now, take down your trousers, and get fucked up the arse by a bloke that hasn't had a wash and that you don't know, and he'll give you 15 quid. And he said, right, yeah, I see what you mean, yeah. So what do I say about that university? I say women deserve better 
They're acting no better than pimps. What they've done is normalize something that is inherently abusive, even without any additional violence than the prostitution experience. And that when women get out of the sex trade, they tell it as it is. And any of those women or men masquerading as sex workers because they're doing their PhD on, on the topic, and they're basically tourists nipping in and out of it, they can fuck off. Yeah, that sounds good to me. I think it's um, I think it's particularly resonant to maybe us at Cambridge as well because um, our, the student body has just selected a women's officer for the entire university whose um, manifesto contains um, a commitment to produce essentially the same kind of sex worker sex worker kit that's been produced at Leicester, um, and also um, the hotly anticipated sequel to the student union's um, How to Spot a Turf guide is going to be a how to spot a swerf guide so clearly this the, these kind of ideologies do come hand in hand um they do, and they, they do come hand in hand and they are the same people um with the same axe to grind which is just their misogynists and their anti-feminists and when i get picketed and disrupted when i do um, events about the sex trade and i'm always with women who are survivors of the sex trade they start shouting about trans ideology alongside their ridiculous slogans like low jobs are real jobs. These people are beyond belief. Yeah, I mean, maybe this kind of ties into one of the questions we got earlier, which is, um, do we focus too much on trans ideology, etc., in feminism now and not enough on women's mater material reality? Or do we need to focus on it as an existential threat to women? The extreme transgender ideology that would have us lose all of our sex-based rights in law and our sex-based women-only services um, is a terrible threat. But the majority of transgender people don't go along with this bullshit. Um, the diagnosis of transsexuality is completely mad and rooted in 1950s pure sexism and, and in sex stereotypes. But... <clears throat> You know, in a sense, that's beside the point, because this is a few extremists that are being aided and abetted by these dude bros who just hate women. And it's 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 just a very handy tool for the men's rights uh, movement. So I never talk about it um, as as separate from that. This is a threat to our sex based rights in and of itself. You know, it's yet more bullshit. But we have to counter the threat to our to our legal um, to our legal rights as women because we fought long and hard for them and we cannot lose them. Now, when I go around the world, or did before this nonsense, um, meeting with feminists in all corners of the globe, I'm always talking about male violence against women and how to counter it. Always. But still they turn up with their banners and their placards. And as I said, it's the trans activists and the sex workers rights activists. And I just look at them and I just see anti-feminism. I don't even see it, take it personally, although it has a personal effect. They just hate feminism. They hate women. So the women that aren't feminists that are on the right, that are fighting against the transgender ideology. Well, every woman has a right to fight for you know, to maintain her sex-based rights in law, but they're not necessarily feminist. And I think sometimes they come out with some bigoted stuff and I think we should be very wary of it. And I always, always insist on talking about male violence and feminism um, as a kind of starting point to critiquing any of the ideology that threatens us. And some of that, you know, would come under the kind of transgender ideology banner. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That makes sense. Um, and again, tying into that, we've had quite a few questions um, from women about kind of how to operate da daily as feminists when um, so many people who call themselves feminists and so many um, of the kind of traditional spaces for feminists like student unions and, um, and feminist societies at universities are actually kind of wildly hostile to feminism or women's liberation 
Um, I'm seeing an account from someone of being a university student um, with a feminist society where the university sends out emails addressed, addressed to um, WUM XN, I'm not entirely sure how you're supposed to pronounce that, and accepts males into the movement. And she asks, how is it possible to associate and find other radical feminists in the real world as opposed to online if your societies are banned and called offensive for being female exclusive? I've been talking with young women at a couple of um, universities in England who have started their own feminist group and they they just do it by word of mouth. I mean, this is terrible, isn't it? that this has to happen. But we always find inventive new ways to counter the misogyny and the backlash. And these women are great. And how it happened with one, with one of the groups of women was that they had, before the COVID lockdown, they'd invited me to come and speak at their university about the sex trade, because that was my last book. And that's what I've spent years campaigning against. And I was really thrilled to be asked to go and speak to students about this because of course all this bullshit about sex work is work and um, how to do sex work safely and, and the like and so often these young women and young men don't get a chance to listen to an alternative viewpoint that's rooted in actual research and the voices of women who've been in the trade and who are in the trade but just before um, I was due to go lockdown came so they decided to host it on zoom and I was no platformed I was actually deplatformed from a zoom meeting the bearded dude bros that run the lgbtq and feminist societies both men both identifying as non-binary what a clever way to identify your way out of being the oppressor actually said i was a swerf and turf and therefore they had to cancel me. These young women were bullied relentlessly and had no choice but to do that. And so we just carried on talking and they've carried on meeting and they've done it outside of that awful institution. And that I'm afraid is what we're going to have to do to get through this if we're in universities, because this is a punishment for doing feminism, for doing actual feminism, as opposed to faux feminism. Yeah, well, I mean, good for them for going on. And, and I'd, I'd say, um, if any of them are watching, please do reach out to us if they want to kind of make some links across. I'll put you in touch. But how great is it being deplatformed from an actual Zoom event? I mean, that was Jackie Weaver before Jackie Weaver. <laughs> Groundbreaking, yeah. Um, kind of in a similar vein again, um, what is the best way to engage with and convince the many young women who label themselves feminist and call for kindness while they enable men's rights activist Kool-Aid to be forced on the rest of us? You know, this thing about kindness and just be nice. Women have been told just be nice forever. Don't make a fuss, just be nice, be kind to men. You know, men get very, very upset, very upset indeed. Um, apart from those that have been trained by feminists and that are under the cosh, under manners. They get really upset, it hurts them um, when we tell them that we don't care if they approve of us, we don't care if they approve of our appearance, we don't want to have sex with them, um, we don't actually want to be led by them. So what they mean when they say nice is they mean capitulate. So niceness and kindness, which I would hope we all aspire to, means capitulation in this context. So any time that you hear those words, just think on your knees, bitch, because that's what we're being told. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I think that's, that's probably all of our experience at Cambridge as well. Um, okay, so I think if we, if we look at some of the questions about how, um, how we can, given the hostility of the environment that women are in, especially young women, um, at trying to find ways of coming to radical feminist thinking and, and to connect and to fight these battles. Um, maybe a big question for all of us, and I'm seeing this in the questions being asked, is how do we do that um, while also reconciling the fact that we're traditionally left wing um, and there's a lot of support being offered to us from right wing and kind of um, perhaps centrist movements as well. Um, how do these two things kind of come together in your opinion? I think we have to resist uh, collaborating with the right. 
feminism has no place outside of the left. It just doesn't because it is the only movement that recognises that there is structural oppression and that women are a sex class in the way that Marx talked about class and the way that then Kate Millett in sexual politics um, applied that to women as a sex class. And I'm sure women before her. But, but um, I hear all the time, how can you say that when you write for the Telegraph, you write for the Spectator, blah, blah, blah. Well, writing for an eclectic readership and writing for publications that are seen as more on the right than on the left is something that we should all do. We should all speak to those people. We should speak to those audience, audiences. We want women to get some feminism with their copy of, you know, whether it's the Telegraph or the Times or whatever. Um, but allying with the right, with those that wish to criminalise abortion, those that wish to uh, criminalise um, same-sex relationships, um, erode the rights of, of women as mothers um, um, during marriage and divorce, rape in marriage, for example, that only became a crime in 1991, thanks to the efforts of feminist campaigners, you know, was resisted by men on the right, in the same men that resist women's uh, reproductive rights. So what we have to do is not take this shit from men on the left. And we have to recognize that this is our left, that we have to do what brilliant organizations like the labor women's groups and a woman's place and actually have our own events and say, we are the left. What you're doing is you are bastardizing and misunderstanding at best what Marx said. Because if you understood what Marx said, you wouldn't be going with any of this gender ideology bullshit. It was the left in general that understood the, the, the politics of social construction, which is how we got to understand that you're not born a criminal or you're not born to be poor or you're not born to be oppressed and homeless. So we, we just have to call, play them at their own game, refuse to accept it. In the spirit of um, trying to almost reclaim the left and unapo un unapologetically be left wing, um, I've got a question from someone who seems to be maybe in a position where they feel like they have to be quite apologetic for their radical feminism um, because they're on the left wing, asking how can we engage in radical feminism and fight for the right for women's spaces without being actively transphobic to trans women, because this is the balance I want to strike. Well, you know, the, the whole phobia thing is nonsense, isn't it? So, so I won't go along with that language. Um, phobia is, is not what we're talking about here. The, the accusation is actually, if we unpick it, being anti-trans person. It's being bigoted towards trans people and wanting to take away the rights that they already have under UK legislation um, and applaud when they are abused, um, defiled uh, and attacked. And I could not work alongside a person who thinks that of any group of people. We are not anti-trans. We are not anti-trans people in the slightest. And what passes for transphobia is literally misgendering when what you're doing is applying a correct term of that person's biological sex. So I'd love to unpick what this person means by transphobia. But none of us are transphobic except for some of those women that aren't in the women's movement, that aren't feminists, that aren't on the left, and that think it's perfectly fine to laugh about trannies or make disparaging comments about appearances, which has no place in feminism. Thank you. Yeah. Um, similarly, um, we're trying to, get, trying to unpick this a little bit. Um, why is it that you think so many women have bought into these ideologies that don't benefit us? For example, sex work is work or trans women are women. What's in it for us? Someone's asking. Feminism is really hard and it, it has consequences for women. Um, it has, you know, it brings us great joy and it's a brilliant way to live, to be a feminist, to know that you're waking up every day resisting um, patriarchy and being visible and, and vocal about it, but it costs us dearly. And it can 
really fracture relationships with with men that we love. It can mean that we are um, cast aside um, from polite society. We are vilified for being feminist. We are routinely labelled as man haters. And many women get very, very upset by that and get very upset at the thought that what we're doing is pointing the finger at the men that they happen to like. Actually, we are pointing the finger at all men. It is all men because all men benefit from what some men, a big, a large number of men do to women. So it is all men and it's certainly all women. So what's in it for them? Well, a quieter life, male approval and less stress in their lives. It's difficult to put your neck on the line when half of the planet will be again, more than half the planet, because so many women are terrified of feminism. It's a lonely place to be sometimes, but it's a global movement. It's a growing movement and it's intergenerational. I will not have it that there is an ideological war between young women and older women or second wave feminists and new feminists. It's about ideology, not, it's not generational. I know that's how it's been played out, but we need to resist that and, and work across every single age group together. No, certainly, I think, um my feminism has been massively influenced by conversations with my mother. Um, and I hope a little bit vice versa. Um, so an, a more specific question um, from Dr. N. In, in your experience, is the press coverage problem coming from the beliefs of the reporters or from editorial control? I think stupidity. I think most people don't understand this whole nonsense about gender and sex and the difference between the two terms. So much of it isn't willful. It certainly is at The Guardian. There's no two ways about it. Um, you know, they're very, very wedded to it being really a US publication. And the idiots that work at Guardian US can't make it, can't distinguish between Trump saying that trans people shouldn't be in the military and also, of course, lesbians and gay men. Um, and knowing that Trump's a massive bigot and feminists saying gender is a social construct and we shouldn't lose our sex based rights. So with with you know, the New York Times, for example, uh, and The Guardian, it is absolute, it's willful. Um, but, you know, often the writers or the the um, commissioning editors are plain stupid or plain cowards. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm going to jump around again because I'm getting so many questions I can't keep up and they're all, they're all brilliant. Um, but I have a question almost about your sort of utopian vision for feminism or the the, the future of feminism, um, if we ever get a bit closer to that. Um, how can we reach out to girls and women who don't see themselves as women while still being sensible about their reasons for wanting to run away from homophobia and objectification and stereotypes and female position in the world? Always keep the door open. Always try to talk, always try to include those voices in our discussions and our activism, however difficult and stressful it is to reach across those, those barriers. Just try to talk to each other. And I was absolutely appalled to see some hostility from someone who called herself a feminist towards young women who had transitioned to trans men and who had of course realized that this was harmful and not the answer to her problems that you can't transition your way out of womanhood and was then re you know naming herself as as female and there was hostility towards her as if she'd actually betrayed women this is outrageous to suggest that women who are so abused by patriarchy by men that look for a means to escape. For us, it's feminism, obviously. <clears throat> and to point the finger at them, it's appalling. So we have to keep the door open. Yeah, okay. Um, and someone has made a comment in that vein that her feminism includes trans men, which is why, of course, it's so frustrating to be called a TERF. Um, but, and I, I, think, I think that's an experience that we all have as well. Um, so in light of recent events in France um, on an International Women's Day or the day before, um, I have a question from a feminist in France. Um, 
who would like your advice in terms of strategy for RADFEMS in a country like this where trans activism has started to take over um, with very visible and very aggressive, um, visible kind of um, in ways, but not but it hasn't quite got there yet. How can we open the eyes of younger women who are starting to be completely brainwashed by this ideology? Um, says Maryam. By giving them an alternative conversation, which means getting together with however small a group you are and meeting and talking and inviting other women into it, whatever their views are right now on all of the harmful stuff that's been rebranded as good for women, whether it's trans ideology, pornography, the sex trade, um, religious fundamentalism, whatever, and just have those conversations away from the watchful eyes of the bearded misogynists that are hell bent on keeping us apart. You know, this is what's happening in passes for feminist societies right now, that men are making sure that we cannot show solidarity to each other. That's what it's about. So we must. Yeah. Um, we have a we have a few more quite specific questions. Um, for example, people wondering, um, given your sort of prominence in the feminist community, um, presumably the fact that you know quite a few, you might know the answer to some of these things. Um, do you know if there's anywhere in the UK where um, a radical feminist could do a, a women's studies course or could kind of engage in that kind of academic research without being compromised by sort of the, the fact that everything is now gender studies? I'm sorry, but no, it, it's, it's all that nonsense now. Um, but there are feminists that have plans to to start that up. And there are pockets of feminism, brilliant feminism in universities by academics um, and, and some of the more senior students that are really putting that back on the agenda. And there's loads of feminism happening at universities, which of course is being picketed and protested and complained about. Um, but, you know, maybe they could get in touch with me further down the line and I'll check um, you know what's what but it's pretty grim because the gender studies it's not about gender studies anymore it's just it's anti-feminist studies basically. Yeah no thank fantastic thank you I know I'd be interested in those courses as well. Um, so also in this going back to your the kind of the topic of your talk um, we're having some questions about how this happened in universities and, and what the role of the academy was. Um, if you have anything to say about that. Judith Butler, queer theory. And of course, universities becoming businesses. So students being able to complain and have their own tailor-made narcissistic needs met and austerity and student loans meaning that very few working class and mature students go to university anymore. So it just becomes a narcissistic wank fest. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, um, yeah, I've also got, I've got a few questions um, going back to something specific in your talk about your views on on different kinds of lesbians um on lesbian separatism um and this kind of thing a, a few people asking if you could clarify what you meant by that well in terms of lesbian separatism i mean <clears throat> bring it on when i was um when i was in my late teens and i moved to Leeds and met loads of really brilliant lesbian feminists um uh, you know i would have absolutely nothing to do with men. I walked everywhere because I wouldn't get on the bus because a man would be driving it. There were shops I wouldn't go into to speak to men. I mean, <laughs> you know, it was fun, but it was not sustainable. And um, and there are many women who wish to live in a world without men and move to women's island somewhere, create a women's island. Um, I know that there are those spaces that exist. Now that's fine. Do, do whatever, um, you know, sustains you in your life. But this isn't political 
activism. Um, this is a lifestyle choice. And I make no judgment about that, but it's not feminist activism. Um, what I said about, um, about political lesbianism or being political about your lesbianism is one of the most misunderstood concepts there is. The idea is, and it's said about me on a regular basis, that in saying I'm a political lesbian, I'm not attracted in the slightest to women. I'm heterosexual, but have given them up for Lent for an extended period, you know, for to make a point, to go on sex strike. Um, I'm not a real lesbian because real lesbians are born fancying the midwife, presumably. Um, and, you know, you're born with this innate sexuality. You've got this gene that scientists have spent decades and decades and decades trying to find and never have. So I'm not talking about lesbianism being a choice like the kind of sauce you put on your pasta or a car that you buy. It's not choice is a difficult word to use in this con context because our sexual our sexuality is very hardwired um, and it's pretty static. But how how does the kind of you know, we're born that way, or you're not a real lesbian, translate into those women that come out in their 40s, having been in a heterosexual marriage relationship with a man, meet a woman, um, falls in love and decides this is something that she has put to one side all of her life because it's not acceptable. If women had an open choice, if there wasn't such a thing as compulsory heterosexuality, which patriarchy really, um, it's, it's the underpinning of patriarchy. If women had a real choice, there would be many women choosing to be in sexual relationships, romantic relationships with men, but there would be far, far fewer than there are now. So that's the way that I look at it. And that's what being political about being a lesbian is. It's saying, we are proud of this. We don't have to ask for tolerance. We don't need to be understood and we don't need to suggest that we can't help it and that we're born that way because actually we're very happy thank you very much thank you for that um yeah that's a really useful clarification um so i think a lot of the questions that we're getting now are fantastic but they're sort of going back over stuff that's already been covered so i think we'll go with one more um which was from someone asking why you think um why is it that there isn't more kind of widespread alarm about the increase in, in young girls, particularly transitioning. Um, how, because that kind of comes into the things that there is traditionally supposed to be quite a big moral panic about. And we quite often get accused of creating a moral panic when we talk about this. Um, whereas you can almost understand um, the impact on women being kind of ignored and marginalized by wider society because that happens all the time anyway. Yeah, feminists have made it an issue and the women who have bravely spoken out after detransitioning have made it an issue. And those clinicians that have seen what's been going on that young women are, that are presenting with a myriad of serious problems on account of being female under patriarchy have spoken out. But just have a look at everything else that's endemic to being a female under patriarchy. Rape, child sexual abuse, prostitution, murder, femicide. You know, the only panic uh, ascribed to it, the, 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 only, the only way that we get this conversation in the mainstream is by pushing and pushing and pushing. And it's the same deal. It's just another manifestation of the sexist bullshit that we live under. Uh, and unfortunately, the door is open now for what looks like a handy route out of womanhood. Um, and this is, this is how we need to explain it. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, I think, I mean, thank you so much for the whole talk and for your answers um, to all of these questions. I, I know I've learned a lot and I think, um, it's, I imagine it will have been really valuable for the people who asked them as well. Um, I think my co-president is gonna come in in a second and um, just give some details about our PayPal, um, but to be a bit cheeky, but um, before we do that, I wondered if there was any, if you have any sort of last words um, or if you think you've covered everything. I, I love young feminists speaking out uh, and standing up and being brave and 
fearless, really. We're living under the worst misogynistic backlash I've seen in the 40 years I've been involved in feminism. And what this has done is it's, it's had terrible consequences for so many women, but it's also brought hundreds and thousands of us into activism. And when it's safe for us to physically meet again, we should be as visible and loud on the streets and outside of our public institutions as we possibly can be. And just thank you for hosting this. It's a wonderful series that you've put on and I'm looking forward to all of the others as well. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, on that note, I'd like to say to anyone in Cambridge who's watching, um, please do get in touch. Um, we are, we, we're always kind of a space that's open for, for new members and for female students to find um, a place where they can talk about male violence without being shut down. Um, and now I'll, I'll just, I'll hand over to Phoebe. So if anyone outside of the university would like to contribute, then there are, there is a way that you can do that. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you, thank you so much, Julie, for that talk. It was um, it was fantastic, um, really enlightening. Um, yeah, as you can imagine, um, a lot of this has been unpaid labour, um, hours and hours of it that um, Sophie Imogen and I and other people from the network as well have put in. And um, going forward, when we're post COVID, um, room bookings, etc., when we can meet in person, they're not cheap. So if you could just chuck a couple of quid our way. That would be amazing. I know it's a bit cheeky. Um, our PayPal is in our Twitter bio, which you can you can find us on Twitter at CamRadFems. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna leave it there, but I think you're welcome to keep chatting on the comments or in the Q and A. Um, although I'm not sure if Zoom might be closed down in a minute, but. Thank you so much for coming and um, you know what to do. Our, I think our PayPal is in our Twitter bio. So, so there you go. And if you want to um, view this talk again or anything like that, um, it will be put up as a recording on our YouTube channel. Oh, um, and yeah, of course, I should say when the next one is going to be. Um, that'll be next Tuesday at the same time. And... Who do we have next, Phoebe? Is it Phoenix? Um, who we're talking Phoenix. about um, her prison research and the conservative politics of self-identification? Um, so we'll see you there, and it'll be a similar sort of setup where um, we'll be live streaming onto YouTube as well. Um, so yeah, do do you make sure that you register for all of our other talks? Um, hopefully, they'll all be as brilliant as this one has been. Yeah, we've heard a lot today about the role of the academy in um, in starting this stuff and. Here we've got someone from the Academy next week who can hopefully come in and talk a little bit about how the Academy can end it. Thank you so much again. Um, and I think we're going to end it there, Mary. You could, if you could close down the Zoom. Um, but do keep going on YouTube and um, a big thank you to you all once again.